Ah, ja, guten Morgen. Ich uh, habe mit Juli alle mal wieder da. Bin ihr klar am um Lehren? Ha, 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 ha. Ja, ja, ja. Well, thank you for your invitation to speak today. My name is Desiderius Erasmus Rotero Damus. Uh, Pastor Tim invited me to speak to you today. He always says, if somebody else says something that makes you mad, well, that's not his fault. So, I am here. You can just call me Erasmus if you'd like. I was born in Rotterdam, Holland on October 28, 1466. If I was still alive today, I'd be 551 years old, which is only 400 years shy of Methuselah. Now, I was named after Saint Erasmus de Forme. My father, Gerard, named me after him uh, because he liked him. Uh, some people called Saint Erasmus Saint Elmo. Now, if anybody here calls me Elmo, you're going to be in big trouble today, okay? But that's who I was named after, and it is kind of a spectacular name. Now, one of the things I don't like to talk about, because it was, a, it was kind of a big deal back then, and, and maybe it still is today, is that my parents were never legally married. Uh, my father, Gerard, was a Catholic priest and a pastor. And all of you know that Catholic priests are not supposed to get married and not supposed to have kids. However, my mother, who was Margareta Rutgers, like the football team, uh, was my father's housekeeper, and here I am today. Now, although my parents endured some social alienation and disdain, they cared for me as true parents would until they both died of the plague when I was 17 years old. It ravaged our country during that time. However, before my parents died, they tried to educate me as best as they could. And when I was nine years old, I was sent to the best, uh, best school in the Netherlands to learn Latin. And while I was there, I also began to learn Greek, which started a lifelong love of old languages. I love Greek and Latin, and I'm sure you do too. I just the best thing in the world. It was also there that I was also taught about the importance of a personal relationship with God. And so those two things became very important in my life in the early years. However, my education ended when my parents died when I was 17, when the plague struck my town and my country. And it was after this time that my life descended pretty quickly into poverty. Uh, I was so poor that by the age of 21, I did what poor people did. I decided to become a Catholic priest because you could make some money being a priest. And so I entered the ministry, and by the time I was 25, I was ordained as a Catholic, as a Catholic priest. But while I was in training and while I was serving as a priest, I saw a lot of things that a number of the priests were doing that were just terrible. Um, they abused their religious orders. They took advantage of people in a variety of ways, and it was just not good. Some priests were really good, but a lot of them were not, and they were not in it for the right reasons. And I called attention to this later in my writings, as you'll see. Now, soon after my ordination, I had a chance to leave the church as a priest, uh, and so I did. I moved to northern France, and I became the secretary of a bishop who lived there, and his name was Henry von Bergen. And he hired me because of my fluency in Latin and also my ability to write well. And so I moved there. And he gave me a temporary dispensation. And basically what that means is I didn't have to be a Catholic priest for a certain amount of time while I served for him. A few years later, Pope Leo X himself gave me a permanent dispensation. I never had to work as a Catholic priest again. Instead, I could focus on the thing I loved, which was scholarship. So in 1495, with Bishop Henry's consent and a stipend, I went to study at the University of Paris, where I began to learn uh, not just continued my studies in Latin and Greek and ministry, but also began to study uh, Renaissance humanism, which changed my life. Five years, four years later, I was invited to go to England to teach. And while I was there, I made a number of important connections with the leaders of English thought during the days of King Henry VIII, if you've ever heard of him. 
So first, I taught at the University of Cambridge. I taught the Master of Divinity program. And then I was invited to be a professor at Queen's College, where I stayed for about five years. And I was actually offered a lifetime position there to teach. However, there were a couple of problems I had with England. Number one, I hated English ale. It was just terrible. And I also hated, hated the English weather because I had an issue with gallstones. And during my days, the only known remedy for gallstones was to drink a lot of wine. And I drank a lot, but I could not get rid of my gallstones. So I left England. However, while I was at England, I was learning um, under the direction of John Collet, who taught the Bible a little bit differently than what I had learned um, in the Catholic Church. And so when I returned to Holland, I set out to master the Greek language, which would enable me to study theology at the deepest level possible, especially the New Testament. So despite the fact that I had no money, I began to study Greek intensively day and night for three years until I had mastered it completely. And in order to pay for this, I would beg my friends and former teachers to help me with money. Now, the reason I did that was because of this. I had lots of offers to be professors all over Europe and also to work for certain princes and kings. And they said they would pay me handsomely if I was their kind of in-house scholar. But I knew if I accepted money and I worked for certain people, that they would want me to join their side of the Reformation. And I said, no way. I always was going to be independent of whatever movement was going to happen. And so because of that, I was pretty poor my whole life. Well, my studies in Latin and Greek were becoming kind of a big deal. And I knew that because the Catholic Church was starting to push away from me. So I left Holland and I went to Switzerland, where everyone's neutral, and there I knew I could express myself without fear. And it was also there that I began to entertain guests from all over Europe, scholars, pastors, and priests who wanted to come and study with me and learn what I was learning about the scriptures in Latin and Greek. I guess you could say I was becoming quite famous for my work. Now, there were two projects that I spent a lot of time on during these years. My first project was to collect as many Greek manuscripts of the New Testament as you could. Now, you might say, well, Erasmus, didn't you have a Bible? Yes. I had a Latin Bible that I read from. But my Latin Bible was written 1,200 years before by a guy named St. Jerome in the 300s. Now, think about this. If you were to read your King James Bible version... Um, that's only 500 years old, and the English is only 500 years old. Think if you're reading a Latin translation at 1,200 years. People who are reading Latin couldn't understand it, even if they knew what it was. So one of my goals was to collect as many Greek manuscripts as possible, which meant uh, there was, people had Greek copies in the New Testament all over, but they were incomplete. So one person had the entirety of Matthew, so I sent for that. Somebody else had half of 2 Corinthians, so I got that. I was trying to collect all the Greek things together. And my second project was to write, as I said, a brand new version of the Latin Bible. Instead of being 1,200 years old, it would be very current. Those were my two main projects during this time. So by the time I had begun work on this, I was completely fluent in Greek and Latin, and I could actually translate both ways. In 1516, I published my first Bible, or my first edition of the Latin Greek Bible. And it actually became quite popular in Europe. I sold 3,300 copies, which might not sound like a lot to you, but think about this. At my time, nobody could read Latin except a few scholars and priests. Okay, so I had a very small group of people buying my things, but I sold over 3,000 copies. But even better yet, my new translations of the Bible were being used by some really influential people. Have you ever heard of Martin Luther? Martin Luther bought my Bible and he began translating it into German. William Tyndale bought my Bible and began translating it into English. The people who translated into the King James Version used my Bible to do that. So in the scholarly areas, my, my writings and my translations were becoming very important. 
Now, I want you to know, I never um, translated my Bibles into a different language. I always wor worked with Greek and Latin because those were the languages of scholarship, and I stayed in those parameters. But I was happy to see Luther and Tyndale and others translating it into languages that people could actually understand. Now, a year after I published my Greek New Testament, Martin Luther began his movement in 1517. Now, by the time Luther officially began this movement, most of Europe was already divided up into kind of two camps, Protestants and Catholics. And Luther's 95 Theses just kind of instigated even more. And the thing was also that everybody was trying to get me to join their side of the Reformation. However, in spite of the fact that I had written about the abuses of the Catholic Church, and the priests and clerics, which I had seen firsthand, I was still devoted to my Catholic Church, and I did not want to leave. My hope and goal was to always remain Catholic, and I hoped that through my scholarship and influence, in that way the Catholic Church could experience some reform at least. <clears throat> so it was because of this that I continued to try to remain independent, which meant I was always poor, and that was tough. Now, Martin Luther. At first, I really liked Martin Luther. His criticism of the church was needed, and at one point I described him as a mighty trumpet of the gospel, which I thought was pretty nice. And I also wrote that it was clear that Luther called for some reforms that were urgently needed. <clears throat> I had a lot of respect for Luther. Luther had a lot of respect for me. He spoke of admiration of my writings, my scholarship. And in our early correspondence, we wrote a lot of letters back and forth. Luther expressed admiration and asked me to join the Lutheran party. But, like I said, I was not about to leave my beloved Catholic Church. Plus, I saw my role as being focused on scholarship and biblical languages. So when I refused to join the Lutheran Church, whoa, did things get interesting. Now, Luther was always a pretty straightforward guy and often easily angered. And so because of my refusal, he naturally began to call me a coward and that I lacked purpose in life. But my hesitancy wasn't that I lacked courage. It was rather that I wanted to remain independent and I increasingly saw the violence and disorder that was being instituted by not just the Catholic Church, but also the Lutheran side of the Reform Movement. Now, to one of Luther's friends, I wrote this. His name was Philip Melanchthon, and in 1524, I wrote to him, and I said this. I know nothing of your church. At the very least, it contains people who will, I fear, overturn the whole system and drive the princes into using force to restrain good men and bad alike. The gospel, the word of God, faith, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. These words are always on their lips. But look at their lives, and they speak quite another language. This is what I was seeing in this so-called reform movement. Another thing that bothered me about Luther and his belief that scriptures alone were sufficient was that he completely ignored church tradition, and that bothered me. And it seemed that he thought he alone could offer up a good translation. So I wrote this to him. You stipulate that we should not ask for or accept anything but Holy Scripture, but you do it in such a way as to require that we permit you to be its sole interpreter, renouncing all others. Thus, the victory will be yours if we allow you to not be, or allow you to be not the steward, but the Lord of the Holy Scripture. Yeah, it was probably a little harsh, but that's kind of how I felt. Now, even though I tried my best to remain neutral during the Reformation, both sides were accusing me of being part of, their side, part of the other side. So I wrote things like this. I detest dissension because it goes both against the teachings of Christ and against the secret inclination of nature. I doubt that either side in the dispute can be suppressed without grave loss. However, I kept getting attacked by both sides. From the Lutheran camp, Luther wrote this. Erasmus is a viper, a liar, and the very mouth and organ of Satan. Like I said, he said things how he wanted. On the other side, the Catholics in my own church wrote, 
Erasmus has prepared the way and was responsible for Martin Luther. He has laid the egg, and Luther has hatched it. To which I replied that maybe I did lay an egg for change, but Luther hatched a very different bird entirely. Now, it was because things began to get violent between these two camps that I began writing about religious toleration and ecumenism. Catholics were persecuting Lutherans, Lutherans were persecuting Catholics, and I wrote that religious disputes should be temperate in language. And I also began to argue for greater moderation in punishment. At times I wrote against the death penalty because I believed it was better to cure a sick man than to kill him. Now, to close my, my time with you today, I'd like to reflect on a couple of passages that were really important to me, especially in the time of life that I lived. And these passages come from the Gospel of Matthew and John. Now, Matthew records Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he taught his followers that whenever they argue or fight, they must remember that even though you think your brother or sister is wrong, chances are you're wrong too. Jesus said it like this, if you take a, you have to take the two by four out of your own eye before you can help your brother take the speck out of his. This is one of the things that I worked hard to make clear in my life in writing. If you see a need for change or reform in your church, or the church more broadly speaking, you have to start with yourself. Double down on your own Bible study. Double down on your own prayer. Follow Jesus with greater fervor. And listen to your opponents. And only, you've, only after you've been committed to that can you finally speak into the life of another. Not to tell them about the speck in their eye, but to help them remove the speck in their eye. We don't merely blame the other side as if they are the totality of fault, but instead we take a step back and we examine our own lives, preferably in the presence of a community. And finally, the second scripture that was important to me comes from John 17, Jesus' prayer for unity. Now, it was deeply painful for me to watch my beloved Catholic Church fracture into different parties, Lutherans, Reformed, Anabaptists, Catholics. And it became so easy, it seemed, for people to just decide and leave their church and just start a new thing. And then, after they started a new thing, turn around and heap criticism on the home church and make it seem like it was all their fault. Now, I've heard you Mennonites have a pretty significant history of leaving and splitting up. But that's just it. It can be easy to get angry or be offended. And so sometimes we just leave a church. And then we blame the church for not being maybe a Bible-believing church. Or as we used to say in the 1500s, we just blame them for being the Antichrist or the mouth of Satan. It's all the same thing. Look, I was critical of my Catholic church. But I also loved my Catholic church. And I was committed to it. I viewed my relationship with the church as a covenant. So I advise you here at the end, as I myself did, stay with your church. Double down on your own life of prayer and study. Influence your church through your life in a loving way. And that is my prayer for you, and that is how I would like to pray for you now. So let's pray together. Lord God, we give thanks that you are with us in spirit and in truth. I pray, Lord, for this church and the churches in our community that we might be one together and that we might be the voices of reason with each other and that we might learn to love one another than to just simply leave or give up. Pray for this community that they might patiently endure one another, that they might continue to love one another as you have called them to, and that they might be uh, the people you have called them to be, those people who take the own plank out of their eye and seek to help their brother and sister out of love. So may they know, too, the uh, 
the challenges, of course, of being a church together, but also might they know the unity that you have prayed for us to experience. So we ask that this would be true for us in our lives. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.